Hello and welcome to the Japan Archives, a podcast where we'll be delving into the histories and mythologies from Japan's long history. I'm your host, Thomas. And I'm your co-host, Heather. We'll also be reading a poem for you every week and giving a little history about the poet who wrote it. Ikimashou! So hello everyone, welcome back to this week's episode. We're on episode 27 now of the Japan Archives. And this week I wanted to talk a little bit about the history of Himeji Castle. So as ever, I always start with a question for Heather. So Heather, have you been to this castle? I have not, but I have seen it as I have passed by on the Shinkansen. Oh yeah, it is very close to the train line, isn't it? You can see it kind of up on the hill as you drive by. Mm. Yeah, it's really beautiful. So why have you never been? Just haven't stopped yet. <laughs> it's um, I mean, there's some there's so many other places that we haven't gone to see yet. You know, we've we've been to Hiroshima. We've been to some of the, most of the major cities, but we haven't made it. Haven't made it to Himeji yet. Just no particular reason. Just not on the list yet. Okay, well, that's interesting. So yeah, oh, today I want to tell you a bit about some of the histories, well, some of the more legendary stories that surround the castle of Himeji. Now, I'm sure you'll know what castle in Japanese is, right? Jo. Jo, yes. So castle in Japanese is pronounced Jo. So when you're going around Japan, a lot of the time you'll hear people say like Himeji Jo. What's another castle in Japan? I've completely forgot all my castles now. Nijo Jo. Kururi Jo in Shiba. Oh yes, the one just, yes, Kurui Jo. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. going around Japan, if you see anything that ends in Jo, as a big tourist attraction, it is most likely going to be a castle. So, as some of you may recall, I did visit Nagasaki during November last year when my parents visited Japan. Um, But also while they were visiting, we stopped off on at Himeji on the way down because we wanted to visit the castle there. So we stayed there for one night and we saw the castle in the morning, had a look around before carrying on our merry way down to Nagasaki. So the castle itself, for those wanting to know more of its location, it's in Hyogo Prefecture. And the castle also goes by other names such as Haruro-jo, and Shirasagi Jo, and we can take these in English as meaning something like the White Egret Castle or the White Heron Castle. Now, the reasoning behind these names is that the castle is famous for its white exterior as well as its white roofing, and because of this, because of the way some of the roofs as well kind of flick out at their corners. Some people have said it's comparable to a bird which is about to take flight. So they then naturally over time start to compare it to egrets and herons that were about to take flight. Going into the origins of the castle, we can go back all the way to 1333. But back then it was actually originally built as a fort when a man known as Akamatsu no Namura constructed one there on the top of the hill in that area which was known as Himeyama. Yama being the Japanese word for mountain. Now, the first instance of this fort only lasted for around 13 years before it was then changed and developed a little bit more and became known as Himeyama Castle. And then that castle itself lasted overall another two centuries before eventually we get the castle of Himeji that is still well known to this day. So moving a bit further on in time around 1581 we know that the building was significantly remodeled by someone known as Toyotomi Hideyoshi and this man he added a three-storied keep to the structure. Toyotomi himself is noted and at times dubbed the second great unifier of Japan as he was the successor of Oda Nobunaga who we've mentioned before in episode 7 and he being the man who is historically said to have been the man who reunited all of Japan. Um, because before that, there was a lot of like smaller fiefdoms and local lords, but yeah, he attempted to bring Japan under 
one complete rule. So again, there was more changes over time to the castle. By the time we reached 1600, it was given over to the ownership of someone called Ikeda Teromatsu. Basically, as he aided significantly in the battle known as the Battle of Sekigahara. This battle I'm not going to talk about today, kind of kind of gloss over it. I want to do a specific episode on it, or at least several, because it's quite a big topic. However, Ikeda has been given the castle of Himeji, and so he had the castle completely rebuilt again between the years of 1601 and 1609. This led to the complex being much greater in size, and finally from the year 1617 to 18, several extra buildings were added by a man known as Honda Tadamasa. And that's kind of how the castle remained, mostly unchanged and safe from destruction. The castle was quite lucky as well. We know that during the events of World War II and the extensive bombing of Japan, the castle escaped the damage of the bombings, and it was actually saved as well during one of the, well, what is now known as the second worst earthquake that affected Japan in the 20th century, the Great Hanshin Earthquake. So that happened in the area around where Himeji is, and quite luckily, the castle was severely unaffected. So again, a very, very lucky building. Hmm. Now, of course, there's a lot more we can say about the factual and historical elements of the castle. But like I've said in this episode, I want to go a bit more into the legends and perhaps myths surrounding this building. So I'm thinking perhaps in a future future episode, if there are people who want to learn a bit more about the factual history of Himeji, um, we'll definitely endeavor to do so. So if that is the case, um, I'm just going to say people should let us know maybe on our social medias or messages on our website if that's something they're interested in. But anyway, I want to go back to the law, the laws and the legends surrounding the castle that I've read about. And in total, there are four things hmm. I want to tell you about today. So if you are ready, Heather. Yes, let's go. Okay. So... The first tale we have goes by the name of Ubaga Ishi, uh, which we can translate to something in English like the Old Widow's Stone. So the story goes that long, long ago, when the great castle of Himeji was being built, they ran into quite a sizable problem. Toyotomo Hideyoshi at the time found himself being informed that they had somehow run out of stone for the construction of the castle. And there was no more that could be found to continue and complete the original three-storied keep that they were trying to make. Word spread into the, general pop into the general populace of the problems that they were facing, and eventually this problem and this tale was overheard by a little old woman who lived in the nearby area. Now it's said that even though she may have not been wealthy and she didn't have much that she owned herself, she knew in her heart that she wanted to help with the construction of the castle. And so approaching the construction site, she offered up her millstone so that they may use it to help in the construction of the building. Now, because of her act of generosity, um, other people in the area were motivated to also chip in and help them themselves. And so it said that the people of the area began to donate stones that they had on hand, stones in their houses, stones in their gardens, to help with the construction of the castle. And because of all these acts of generosity, the construction of the castle was finally completed. So that's the first story of the nice old lady that helped in the building of Himeji. The second short tale I have again relates to the construction of the castle. And this one says that there was once a master carpenter by the name of Sakurai Genbei. And we know that he worked for Ikeda Teramasu, the man who we've mentioned at the start, who completely redesigned the building. Now, Genbei, he was the man who oversaw this construction. And after all the years of blood, sweat and tears, the day finally came when he could lay down his chisel and relax from all his hard work and look upon the work that he had created. But it's said that ultimately what he saw actually dissatisfied him, for he saw that the keep he had built actually leaned a little to the southeast. And so, after all these years, his great work of construction wasn't straight. Now, for most people, they would have been able to deal with such a minor 
problem in the construction, but it said that this problem ate away at Gembe day after day until a day finally came when it was just too much for him to bear. And so climbing to the top of the keep, placing the chisel in his mouth that he'd used to carve the stones of the castle keep, he jumped from the top to his death. I wasn't sure if you were going to see the chisel in his mouth and I was like, what is he going to? Oh, he he jumped. That was not what I was expecting. I was expecting him to try to do something to fix the leaning. So I was like, that's not where I expected that story to go. <laughs> it wasn't what I expected when I first read it either. But yeah, so even though it was a minor problem in the construction, yes, he ultimately couldn't deal with it. And yeah, instead of trying to fix the problem, he instead jump to his own death. So the final two things I want to say, um, we can find referenced in a book known as the Furyu Shidoken Den. Now this book we know dates to the to 1763 and was written by a man known as Hiraka Gennai. Now the first thing the book talks about is a strange item which was known as the red towel or the Akatengui in Japanese. There's not much I can actually say about this. We know it is a linked to Hemeji Castle, but sadly the book doesn't really go into much depth about what this actual item is, whether it's a subtle name to a strange creature, or even if it's literally just a red towel, we can't actually be too sure. Modern scholars think that at the time of writing the book, it's the red towel was considered something so well known in Japan that the author didn't feel the need to enlighten the reader any more than just briefly mentioning what it was as the reader presumably already knew what it would be. But because of those reasonings, the actual history and lore behind this strange red towel item has been lost to us. So. A little mystery that we can't answer relating to Himeji Castle, which I think is quite interesting. Um, but the final thing, again mentioned in this book, is that there is actually a yokai, or a monster, which is said to live in the castle. Tell me more. Okay, so the story goes that around the time when the entire complex was being rebuilt and expanded, so like the 1580s into the 1600s, because of the sheer amount of construction that was done and because of how big the castle grew, there was a local shrine in the area which had to be moved to make room for the expanding castle. Now the god or creature which dwelt in the shrine at the time apparently grew very angry. And so a few years later, it said that the lord of the castle ultimately fell quite ill. The people believing that his illness was caused by the creature or the god that had dwelt in the shrine which had to be moved, they decided that they would rebuild a shrine for it within the castle grounds in the area where it once used to live as a way to try and appease the spirit. And it said that this worked, the lord of the castle once more became well, and presumably the creature, as it had now had its home back, allowed the lord to be well once again, and troubled the the lord and the castle no more. Now the shrine was ultimately given the name of the Osaka Bay Shrine and so that name also became the name of the creature which dwells in that shrine and in Himeji Castle itself. So he's not currently haunting. He's been appeased so he's not currently like you won't like in the dark in the night you won't see the creature walking through or the the, the yokai walking through the halls, maybe not halls or stairs, <laughs> walking through the stairs. Yeah, nothing I've read says that you could potentially reawaken the spirit or the creature and like cause him to be angry again. And the general consensus is that it was a creature that used to be a threat, but because they rebuilt its original shrine and its home for it, it has been appeased and no longer poses a threat. But still presumably lives within the castle, or at least the castle grounds to this day. Well, at least he's happy and content and has a home. That's good. True, very true. But there is in fact one more story Ooh. linked to the castle of Himeji. And if you're a fan of Japan or if you've actually visited the castle itself, I'm pretty sure you'll probably know what it is I'm going to tell you about. And that is the story of Okiku from last week's episode. What? 
when I told the story of Okiku last week, I mentioned that the samurai retainer lived in the province of Harima and he worked for the local lord who ruled the area. Now Harima province is in the location is was located in the area of modern day Himeji. And so the samurai who served his lord, the lord would have lived in the castle of Himeji. And so the well that Okiku finally died in and was thrown down is within the grounds of the castle. Really? Whoa. So he, did you know that when you told me the story and just kept that for this week? Or did, did you just find that out? Hey, I already knew that. <gasps> oh, so you just, you you withheld that from, from all of us to share it this week. Ah, I see, I see. <laughs> I thought it would be a nice little tie-in and a nice little revelation for you and others. So yes, the story of Okiku, which was in Harima province, like I said, was in what is now the modern day of Himeji. Oh, can you see the well? You can, it's in the castle grounds and you can walk around it. You can look down to the bottom. There's a little sign outside telling you a short version of the story of Okiku as well, which is nice. But also I should say, going back to the story of the millstone, as when you're walking around the castle as well, you can actually see the millstone in the castle walls. Um, it's been covered up by like a little covering. So yes. So you can see the well of Okiku, but you can also see the millstone that was apparently gifted by this old woman in the local area. Oh, wow. So there's actually tangible objects for, for this one, not just, um, not just myths, but actual physical objects. Wow. Yes. So you can still go see them to this day. Okay, so now I've got more reasons to visit Himeji Castle. Wow, that is so cool, Thomas. That's awesome. I'm glad you liked it. But yeah, so they are my stories for Himeji Castle. They're all very short, but as we know, this is a bite-sized history podcast we do. So yeah, what did you think? That's really fascinating. I mean, yeah, I mean, I know I knew a little bit about Himeji Castle, but I didn't know any of the, the, the lore surrounding its building. And I didn't know when it was built. Also, I'd assumed like a lot of castles here are reproductions or they've had extensive work done to them and i didn't realize that that was part that's still the original building so it wasn't damaged in any of the the bombings or the earthquakes that's really amazing and i really do now need feel like i need to go and visit because it's not that far from hiroshima ken i don't think a couple hours drive or something like that so it's not that far so you have to visit soon then and report back well, I do have a question. So some of the castles, you can't go all the way up to the top. Some you can, some you can't. Um, some are, I think I've been in one that was like basically a couple of floors. How far can you go into Himeji Castle? So for Himeji Castle, you can go right to the top. Ah. So the interesting thing about the top is from the research I was doing about the Osaka Bay Shrine, there is one close by to the castle. Um, but from what I could see on some sites which talk about the insides of the castle itself, there is also a shrine on the top floor, and some people have stated on their websites that that shrine also is called the Osaka Bay Shrine. So there is the potential that if those sites are correct, that when you visit the castle and you walk all the way to the top, you can then visit the shrine where the Osaka Bay creature also lives. How many floors is Himeji? In total, if you go to the castle to climb it, the castle has a total of six floors plus a basement floor. Oh, okay. So a nice climb. It's a nice climb. It's not too difficult as well. They kind of funnel you. So you climb up one side and then you can go down the other. And it's quite cool because as you go up, the floors get increasingly smaller and smaller. There's a lot of, well, obviously a lot of it is still original or how it at least used to look so there's a lot of like the old weapons racks as you go up a lot of the old like raised walkways should the castle ever come under attack and things like that to look at so it's definitely a very cool castle to walk around like one of my most favorites that i've seen while i've been in japan yeah i'm really intrigued now yeah and I, i've seen some of the pictures but yes please be sure to post more pictures so that all of us can see the pictures you took from him, AG. Yes, I have posted most of them when I did originally go 
Um, I think there's a few I've yet to post, so I will post those over the next few days up on the Instagrams for people. But yes, there are the old photos as well from a few months ago if you wish to go look at those as well. Um, but I'll also stick a few in the show notes as well for this week. So don't worry about that. Excellent. Thank you. It's okay. Ah, uh, so like every week, that is my <laughs> section over. So what do you have for me this week? Well, Thomas, I have a, I'm going to see if I can say this. Hayakuchi kotoba. Okay. What is that? It is tongue twister in Japanese. Oh, okay. Because I know last time we did a tongue twister, we didn't know the Japanese. No, in my research, I found that I was I was so excited. And honestly, why it didn't occur to me to look up the definition of tongue twister, that's okay. I have learned it now, and I'm really excited. And it, it basically means fast mouth words. Haya kuchi kotoba. Haya, like hi, haya, ku. Like that quickly, like fast. mouth. Kuchi, mouth, kotoba. So kotoba is what, sorry? Words. Words? I thought mm. tango was word. I think is kotoba it's also. Vocabulary, I believe. So oh, like, I see. Okay. So like actual, like the individual words. So uh, tango is like the vocabulary and then, yeah, yeah, I think. But now I have to go back and check my dictionary <laughs> to be sure. Okay. So I have my pen and paper ready for the Japanese. Okay. And it is a tongue twister. I am not great at tongue twisters, which might be really entertaining. And also, I'm, I'm going to make you do it as well, because that will also be really fun. <laughs> so I won't be alone. <laughs> I'll try my best. I'll try my best. All right. Niwa 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 tori ga iru. Niwa 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 tori ga iru. Oh, yeah, that was perfect. Niwa, 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 tori ga iru. So it's one, two, three, four niwas. <laughs> niwa, 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 tori ga aru. Iru. Iru o aru. Ah. Iru. Niwa, 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 tori ga iru. Mm. So what does that mean? As in, well, tori as it is it, is it the tori as in bird? And iru as in like a verb to have? Yeah, so you do have... I forgot what niwa is. You do have... You're on the right track for tori, but it's a specific type of bird. Sparrow. Um, I was going to say you can eat this I just this randomly one, picked a bird. You can eat sparrows. Can we, eat we saw that in Kyoto. Did you see the sparrows on a stick in Kyoto when we were walking in the market? I did. It was weird. That was... It was very strange. There was too many people. I couldn't get a picture. I... I don't know if I want it to, to be honest. And but yeah, so it's a it's larger than a sparrow, and it's a typically commonly eaten bird. <laughs> I'll give you a hint: you might eat it at Christmas in Japan. Of course, of course. How silly of me, Niwatori. It's a chicken. You are right. It is a chicken, and the translation is: there are two chickens in the yard. If there's only two, why do you say niwa four times? Well, there's the counter for, so you get niwa ni, um, so you have, oh, excuse me, you have niwa, which is yard, but you also have, oh shoot, what are they called? Prepositions. Um, 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 oh my gosh. <laughs> like you have like wa, ni, to, ga, the joining words, what are those called? I forgot. Oh my God. Prepositions. Thank you. You have the prepositions. So you have like niwa as in uh, yard, but you have ni wa as in like the prepositions, and then you have ni wa, which is a counter. So the fun thing about Japanese is that sounds are similar, but there could be different a like, kanji, there could be different um, like hiragana, for example, wa is also could be read as ha, but you use it wa when it's a preposition. So in this, we have the second wa is ha. It's not a preposition. We did that wrong. It's a particle. Thank you. It's a particle. I was like, I, yeah, particle. Yeah, see, this is the fun part. So for everyone at home who was like screaming that we were getting the word wrong, we figured it out. We're so sorry. We got there in the end. See, the fun part about learning another language is that sometimes you forget your first language. I'm not kidding. That happens quite a bit. I'm like, what's that? That word. <laughs> oh, learning is great. Particle. So the wa is a particle. 
essentially there's three was and one ha. And I'll, I'll write this down. I'll have it in the show notes and you'll see how it, it'll make more I was sense. I going to say in the show notes, yeah. Let, let me see it broken down so I know which bit is which. Because I'm still very confused. But I also kind of understand, so... Today's tongue twister is also, let's learn a little Japanese. <laughs> yes, let's. So, let me try and say it one more time without thinking. Niwa, 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 tori ga iru. I think you forgot a niwa. Niwa, 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 tori ga iru. Niwa, 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 tori ga iru. And feel free to play along at home, people. Like, don't, don't leave us to sound like idiots. You know, please, please try yourself. And let us know how it goes. That would be great. Thank you. And since we're talking about Japanese, Thomas, you mentioned aru and iru. So this is a beginning Japanese lesson. Um, aru is to be. It's, um, it is it to be. Um, and it's for inanimate, not alive objects. So like a pencil or your cell phone or a car is aru. But for living things, like people birds, animals, it's iru. So it's to be. So you, you have to be careful when you use your irus and arus to make sure you use them with the right um, object. So in English, we would just use be, but in Japanese, it depends on the living state of does, it's probably a silly question, does iru change to aru if something dies? Do you know, I have asked this exact question and I knew the answer at one time, and I've completely forgotten it. So that's something I'll have to look up and get back to you on. Okay, I'm going to quiz you on it next week. I want to write that down. Oh, that's great. So next week, yes, please ask me about Iru Aru, dead or alive. Okay, I shall do. So thank you for the tongue twister, Heather. Thank you so much. You are very welcome. That was that was really fun. So yeah, try to say it like five times fast um, for those playing at home. Say it five times fast and... and uh, let us know how you how you go on. <laughs> yes, definitely. But yeah, I'm guessing that's us done for today then. Yeah, thank you so much for the stories about Himeji. And um, thank you for sharing all that you found out and surprising us with Okiku. Oh, you're very welcome. Yeah, I hope you kind of liked it, like four short stories. But like I said, we kind of do bite-sized stuff. Hmm. We do have plans going forward to... We have a lot of future episodes already planned, which are along the same theme of Bite Size episodes, but we do at some point want to put aside maybe three or four episodes, which will be a bit longer, where we can jump into some of the more, how would you say, bigger and juicier bits of Japanese history that you can't really look at in Bite Size bits, but that might take us a little bit longer. There's a bit more research that has to be done, a bit more planning to do, but we'll get there eventually for you all we promise so we hope for now you're enjoying these episodes thank you again for tuning in this week and thank you to everyone who listened to heather's song um we had a lot of listens just over the first two days so we're very happy about that i personally really liked heather's acapella version of the song i hope you did too now i'm blushing oh gosh (laughs) (laughs) thank you But yeah, guys, thank you again for tuning in this week. If you're enjoying this, you know, please let your friends know. Tell their, get your friends to tell their friends so they tune in. Just try and spread the word around a little bit if you enjoy the show. But yeah, until next week, I think that's everything for me. What about you, Heather? That's everything for now. Okay, then. So until next week, guys, matane. Matane. If you've enjoyed the Japan archives, please consider checking out historyofjapan.co.uk, a database we are making on Japanese history. You can also find the show notes for all our episodes here. If you're on Instagram, you can follow my account over at nexus underscore travels. That's N-E-X-U-S underscore travels. We also have a Facebook and Twitter page, which you can find at Japan Archives. If you're interested in little slices of life in Japan, be sure to check out my website over at heatheroveryonder.com. Thank you for tuning in today. We hope you enjoyed the episode. And if you have any suggestions for future episodes, have anything you'd love to hear about, head on over to historyofjapan.co.uk and send us a message. If you enjoyed the show, please be sure to give us a rating and review over on iTunes. Thank you again for listening, guys. Until next time, bye. Matane!